name is Dave McGinnis. Uh, I used to be at Fermilab for 23 years, and then three years ago I moved to Sweden, and now I'm the chief engineer for the accelerator for the European Spallation Source. So a lot of people recognize me from being at Fermilab. Um, I just recently got a new computer, and it's got some fun problems that I'll figure out. Um, I put up the web address here. Uh, sorry about this. I'll, I'll probably put this on the ESS website so that it doesn't have to type in so much numbers. So you can, this is this is the web address here. It's a Dropbox account. And I'll fix that up. I forgot about doing that. And then here's Ralph's and our uh, email address here. Um, so Ralph went through kind of a lightning fast thing to get you going in terms of uh, how to use the spectrum analyzer because that's going to be your first lab. So we don't want you to sit here and listen to lectures for so long once it's a lab class. So we want you to touch some buttons. But sooner or later, you've got to understand some of the things that are going to go behind here. So this class is going to talk about transmission lines, uh, which is basically the major component you're going to be using in RF. Everybody thinks about uh, uh, RF in terms of, oh, that's great. Okay. Everybody think, turns about RF in terms of, um, you know, amplifiers and so on. Mostly about RF, it's about getting energy from point A to point B. Almost everything you can think of in RF has to do with you've got a signal over here and you want to put the signal over there, whether or not it's a telephone or whether or not it's a computer signal, whether or not it's uh, uh, energy from a klystron to the particle beam. Mostly it's about getting energy from point A to point B. And transmission lines are the major component for doing that. Um, now, we're going to talk about, Ralph showed a lot of things about different frequencies. In most cases in particle accelerators, you're only dealing with one frequency. Okay, you, the frequency of the RF system. Especially now that the rage in all accelerators these days is to build superconducting Linux. And it's pretty kind of a boring machine for most accelerator physicists because there's only one frequency. Okay, but anyway, so this will be kind of the thing to think about in terms of one frequency, many frequencies, and so on. And one of the toughest things you're going to have in this course, if you're not used to it already, is how to start thinking in the frequency domain. Ralph and I think in the frequency domain more clearly than we think in the time domain. Most people that come from particle physics, they think in terms of the, the time domain. The particle's here, and it's going to here, okay? Where in the frequency domain, you have no idea about time, but you're talking about frequency, okay? So it's going to take you about maybe two or three laps, and you'll start to click it a little bit in there. So don't get so frustrated right away that if you're starting to say this frequency stuff I'm not quite getting, it takes a little bit to think that way. All right. All right, so uh, th this is uh, just boilerplate. Um, in this lecture, we're going to cover a lot of stuff. Phasers, traveling waves, characteristic impedance, reflection coefficient, standing waves, impedance and reflection, incident reflected power, Smith charts, loading and matching, single stub tubers, DB and DBM. Ralph and I will talk about this until you guys are blue in the face. Z and S parameters, Lorentz reciprocity, network analysis, and phase and group delay. This is basically about two years' worth of graduate work uh, rolled into basically 90 minutes. So I don't expect these guys to really, to really get through this, but at least you'll know the lingo, okay? So you'll hear the lingo and you can sit back and go and say, okay, I, I understand. Okay, uh, this is the, the other lectures we'll talk about. All right, so the first thing is we're going to start off this is going to be mostly the thing that you're going to keep going back to what you're trying to build. Ralph says don't get up in the morning and come to work unless you know what you're trying to build. This is what we have. We have some kind of source here, and we want to put that source onto a circuit. Okay? Whether or not this is a phystron and this circuit is the beam or a cavity, this is what we're going to try to do. In most cases, we're going to be talking about a single frequency. That is, there's a voltage. It has an amplitude, V0. It has a frequency, omega t, omega, that it goes around, and it has a phase. That's the starting point of the wave, okay? So if, if uh, the phase, so this is how tall the wave is, and the phase is the starting point of the wave, okay? So in order to characterize um, a wave, in time, you basically have to think about position and velocity, right? That's time domain. It's position and velocity. Where are you, and how fast are you going? Okay? In the frequency world, you have to think about two things always. What's your amplitude and what's your starting point? Okay? So those are the two things you have to think about. So you need two things to tell you about in any case. You need two things to tell you about. Now, what we're going to do then 
is we're going to get tired of real quick of writing cosine omega t all the time. It, it makes trigonometry, it takes a long time to do that. So you can make life real simple, and you guys all saw this back in college days, is basically writing cosine omega t plus phi, you can write as the real part of v0 e to the j omega t plus phi. So Ralph and I are electrical engineers, and we learned very on that we use j, plus e to the plus j omega t, okay? And people sit and say, you should be using e to the minus i omega t. I will guarantee you that none of these network analyzers work at e to the minus i omega t. You'll get the wrong answer in phase. Where it's arbitrary, for a physicist, phase goes up as a function of frequency. For an engineer, phase goes down as a function of frequency. Okay? So while you think e to the j omega t is an arbitrary thing, all the network analyzers that you're going to work with here assume e to the j omega t. Okay? So get used to the time way the vectors are going to spin. Okay, so our, our vectors spin this way here. Physicist vectors spin that way. Okay, and they get different answers. Okay, depending on what you're doing. All right, so you can write this then is you can separate out the the v zero e to j phi and e to the j omega t. And most of the time, we're not going to write down the e to the minus e to the j omega t. We'll just spend all our time writing this down, and we'll assume that it's e to the j omega t afterwards. If it's a linear system, we can add it in backwards at the end, okay? So again, j is the square root of minus 1 for electrical engineers. i is related for current, right? Now, again, remember, when we're going to talk about waves, you have to talk about two things with waves. You have to talk about its amplitude, how big, and where did it start, okay? And you've got to keep those two concepts, when you go through this class, keep those two concepts in your head. How big is the wave, and where did it start, okay? And you'll start understanding the frequency name pretty clearly. Okay, so again, I keep I keep uh, building this. Um, uh, I'll keep beating this into the ground here. This is this is probably the more fundamental slides. V zero e to the j phi. You could just use Euler's identity and sit there and say that's v zero cosine phi plus j v zero sine phi. So where this is basically the way you can think of this, you have a amplitude and a phase. How big is it? The words to start off with it. You could also instead of say doing that, it has a real part and it has an imaginary part, or it has an in-phase part and it has an out-of-phase part. Okay. So either way, you can think of it. How big is the end wave? Where did it start? Or it has an in-phase part and it has an out-of-phase part. Okay. So Ralph and I, you'll hear us talk about this interchangeably. We'll talk about amplitude of phase in one sentence. And the next sentence, we'll talk about real and imaginary parts. And they're interchangeable, okay? So basically, you just take the tangent of this, and you get the phase. And you just take the square of this, and you get the amplitude, okay? But remember, always I'm going to say this about five times in this, in this lecture. You need two parts to, to define a wave. Amplitude or phase, or in phase and out of phase, okay? All right, now, in all these sources, our sources are sine waves. And I'll talk to you later on in the beam signal lab in which we take sine waves and we put them together and we make all sorts of arbitrary signals. So once you work with sine waves, you can, you can use Fourier transforms or Fourier mathematics and get these back to do it anyway. We're going to describe um, our circuits by complex phasers. So you could say that this has a real part and an imaginary part. And so here's my real part. Here's my imaginary part. And then this vector is always going to spin at a rate of omega t. So I can always find out what the amplitude is by taking the projection on the real axis. So I'm not sure how many times people have seen phasers. If you haven't, this might be something where we can sit down later on this evening and talk about phasers and make sure we draw it on a board that you kind of get the idea. So you have, a, you, have a, you have a magnitude and you have the angle away from the real part. And then this thing will spin around at omega t. In the real world, we just take the projection onto the real axis. But we're going to need to keep this, uh, this phaser concept in order to be able to do the math. Okay? All right. Now, again, so this thing is going to be really boring. We spend our whole next 90 minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll do half and half. I don't want to kill you too much. But we're going to talk about a simple transmission line. Now, most of the time, the, yeah. Um, okay, okay. Um, you said something about in phase and out of phase. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you relate the imaginary and the real part? So, 
it depends again on language. Okay. Okay. Uh, when I mean out of phase, I mean the quadrature part, 90 degrees, not 180 degrees. And that might be what you're confused about, or you could be confused about. So let me draw it on the board. I wish we had blackboards in these schools because it makes it a lot easier. Instead of me drawing on a PowerPoint and zipping along, it's easier to, to draw it out. Okay. So if I have a wave, like, uh, like I have a wave that goes like this, and I'm going to probably do it wrong. So don't take this literally. Okay, I have a wave that looks like that, right? Now, I can draw this wave. If I did it right, I can draw this wave. as a real part plus an imaginary part. Okay? So, V0, e to the j phi, is equal to, the right colors, V0, cosine phi, plus j v0 sine phi. So I call this the out of phase, or the imaginary part. And I call this the in phase, or the real part. OK? So remember, so let me just do this again really slowly. We have V of t is equal to V0 cosine omega t plus phi. That's a time domain, that's a time domain thing. If you could sit, plot that on an oscilloscope, you would know how to do that. I can write this as equal to V0, sorry, is equal to the real part of V0 e to the j omega t plus phi. Which is equal to the real part of v0 e to the j5 times e to the j omega t. So we think of this guy here as our complex phasor. He's got a magnitude, he's got an angle, and this test tells us he just spins around at e to the j omega t. Okay? And so you can think of this is that when I take a look at this projection here, here's my v0 e to the j, e to, e to the j5, that's my vector. It's got a real part, the cosine. It's got an out of phase part. And in the real world, he's going to spin. Okay? And that's how we're going to represent weights. Okay, so phase always has to do, and that's, that's a very good problem. So when people sit there and talk about phase, okay, phase is always with respect to something. Okay? So phase has, so there's no universal phase. So phase can be the time at which you call t equals zero when you start your stopwatch on a trigger. Your phase can be different from somebody else's phase, okay? So right now, the way I've written this, I wrote this thing down cosine omega t plus phi. What's my t? t can be, I can put my time reference to be anything I want. And you will do that in your lab. Now, one of the things you're gonna say is, that, but Absolute phase means nothing, okay? Phase differences mean everything, okay? So when we talk about this, I'm, so, so I'm just starting off with the math at first, right? So this is the good thing. What you're going to do is that, for example, think about it in this case, you have a klystron, and you have a signal source at the, at, at the klystron. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's, the, uh, uh, it's, it's the e to the j, it has some e to the j omega t. Okay, that's gonna be at the beginning of your accelerator. And that will be on your, um, your RFQ, for example. You have an RFQ, and you will then have this sine wave generator that will go onto that RFQ. It will bunch the beam, because the beam comes in off the ion source unbunched. It will bunch that beam with that imprint, right? It has to. It, it does that. Now you're going to have another accelerating station down the way, okay? So you have to get the phase of that accelerating station to be related to the phase of that guy. You just can't let it free wheel, because otherwise it's just going to cancel that out. So you basically get to sit there and say, I have my starting phase. It's the phase of my RFQ at the beginning. 
He's the phase of everybody, and everybody else is related to that. So you make a very good point. Phase is always with respect to something, but you get to define what it's with respect to. Okay? Um, and, and I'm not sure that I'm answering your question completely, but that's what you do. So now, when you talk about that, you can sit there and say, my master oscillator of my Linux, okay, he has a given starting point T. And then all my waves down the Linux either are in phase or in quadrature phase of that, or have some combination of that. But I do get to sit there and say, T0 is this point here, okay? And you get to move that around depending on the, how you want to work the problem. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Right. All right. <clears throat> All right. So now, I just did the basics, the starting does with the, the ground waves. Now we're going to talk about a transmission line. What everybody's seen in transmission line, there is transmission lines, you usually see the coax coming out of the, your wall, right? That's usually the, the most people in the world, that is what a transmission line is. Us accelerator folks, we know a little bit more. We know that they're waveguides. We know that there are uh, twisted pairs. We know that there are all sorts of transmission lines that are around there in the world. Uh, you can get energy from point A to point B in, in many different ways. Okay, but we're going to use a trans, we're going to use a coaxial line because we'll be seeing it in the lab easy to work with and it's easy for us to understand. So um, the nice thing about this, this is a TEM transmission line, transverse electromagnetic wave transmission line, okay? And I'm not going to talk about too many things about modes and stuff like that in transmission line for, for waveguides. That's for a whole different class that we could talk about at some other point. But TEM is a very important point. Uh, TEM means that my electric field here, as you can see, is radially, and my magnetic field circles around this thing here, and it's perpendicular to the direction of travel, right? Um, that can only happen, and you can prove this to yourself, if you have a metal conductor for it to close around, okay? So really, in theory, a TEM wave can't even exist in free space, okay? It takes infinite amount of energy because there's nothing for it to, come to, for it to conduct around. It only shows up in an approximation, okay? So as you take, if you go to an antenna tower, there's no TEM waves coming off an antenna tower. You get far enough away, it kind of looks like a TEM wave going off there. But the only way you can get a TEM wave is for something for the magnetic field to curl around, a piece of copper. If there's no piece of copper for it to curl around, you can't get a TEM wave. That means beam pipes cannot support TEM waves, all right? That means that uh, waveguides cannot support TEM waves. All right, so now one of the things that you'll see is, is people love to stretch wires to make them look like beams, right? They can't be because it's not a TEM wave that lives in a beam pipe. So there's a whole issue about when you go back to your labs and start talking about stretch wires, it can't be the beam because the beam does not support a TEM wave. It generates a TEM wave in approximation, but it can't support it. So I, that's a side point there. But this is a very special type of transmission line. And the nice thing that is that if, it can, if it's a TEM wave, what's really nice is that what happens at low frequencies is the same that happens at high frequencies. So I can put a low frequency signal on a coax. I can put in 10 volts of DC signal or a kilovolt of DC signal on this guy. But I can't do that on a waveguide. That's kind of a no-brainer. How do I put a DC voltage onto a waveguide? It's impossible. So if you have a metal conductor that you can close around, you can work from DC to daylight, okay? But with a waveguide or with anything else without a metal conductor to go on, it has a frequency characteristic to go to that. So I'm not going to talk about waveguides in the class itself. If people want to talk about waveguides and stuff like that outside the class, we can, we can sit around and have a, an evening session on that. Okay, so now that means that I can then start looking at this, this frequency thing at, at low frequencies. At low frequencies, I understand. High frequencies are hard. Low frequencies, I understand. So the first thing you could do is you could put a charge on the inner conductor. And the charge on the inner conductor that you could put in, put in there is going to be given by the capacitance per unit length times the length, the little piece of length. This is capacitance per unit length times a little piece of length times the voltage. So if I put a voltage from here to here, the difference in charge that I'm going to get from here to there is given by the capacitance per unit length times the little bit of length. The magnetic flux 
that's going to go through any plane here is going to be given by the inductance per unit length times the length times the current that's flowing through the inner conductor and returning the outer conductor. Okay? So that's just basically definitions of inductance and capacitance. So what I can do then is I can make a model of the transmission line, a little short piece of transmission line. I can make a model. It has series inductance and it has shunt capacitance. So let's go back and think about that really physically. How does that mean? So you, as Ralph pointed out, you can charge up a center conductor of a coaxial cable, right? You can put a static charge on a piece of cable, right? And the amount of charge you can store on there is given by the capacitance per unit length times the length that you can store in there. The next thing that you do is you can store magnetic field inside a cable. You can run a DC current through there and store magnetic field inside that cable. In fact, if you try to change that current quickly, the cable will buck back at you. It has an inductance to it. It'll buck back at you. Or if you try to put a voltage across a cable instantaneously, it takes a while to charge up. Okay? So you can see that it has a capacitance and shunt, and it has a series inductance. Okay? So now we can sit there and say, what's this voltage drop across this inductor? Well, it's the voltage here minus the voltage here is given by the inductance times the time rate of change of the current. Okay? So the drop across the voltage across the inductor is given by the time rate of change of current. If I try to change the current in the inductor too quickly, it bucks a voltage back at me, right? All right? The current flowing through this capacitor, okay, is just given by the current coming in, the current coming out has to be left over if the current's got to be flowing through the capacitor, and that's given by the capacitance times the time, time chater change of the voltage. So to charge up a cable, it takes time um, to charge it up, the change of voltage is change in time. Okay, so people, I'm assuming, have seen these basic classes in physics. So now, what you're going to start seeing... Okay, so let's just keep going here. I won't get too complicated. So now let's take the limit as x goes to small. Let's just take a very short section of transmission line. Okay, that means that the dv dx... So let me just go backwards to just so that you guys see this. Here you see this is delta v. This V cancels this V. This is delta V. There's a delta X. This is delta I. There's an I, and this I cancels, so this is delta I. So you have delta V is equal to L, delta X, the I dt. Delta I is equal to C, delta X, the V dt. So let the limit as X goes to zero, you get dV dx is equal to minus L, the I dt, and the I dx is equal to C minus C, dV dt. So these are called the telegraph equations. And they knew they figured this out. They, took, they did telegraph equations before they did, before Mr. Maxwell came along. Okay, and they actually knew this stuff, that this kind of stuff happened. And then Mr. Maxwell comes around and he's the guy that sits there and says, puts this guy in here, right? So he's the one in, that was in there. Faraday did this, and Mr. Maxwell put in this, this term here. So the telegraph equations here are basically Maxwell's equations. So you can derive Maxwell's equations just by looking at a transmission line. Okay, so, so what most of the time people will be spending around using Maxwell's equations, which are a disaster to work with, and you can, these, are, these are Maxwell's equations in one dimension. Okay. So, the solutions to Maxwell equations are waves. Okay, so everybody pretty much remembers that. And the solutions to here, whenever you have this, this delta x, delta t, delta x, delta t, you know that the solutions have to be traveling waves. And you can put in that the traveling waves here, there is a forward wave, and there is a reverse wave. Here is a forward wave, here is a reverse wave. So how do you know what a forward wave is? T always goes forward, um, at least here, maybe not where I work at, but T here goes forward. And as T goes up in time, then in order to keep that, to watch the top of the wave, then X must go up in time. X must go up as well. So if T goes up, X must go up. So you can see as T, goes, as T goes up, this guy is traveling in the forward X direction. I always get confused because there's this minus sign here. But this is the thing to remember is as T goes up and forward, X must go up and forward. Here, as T goes forward in time, X must go negative in order to keep the same phase. Right? And the same is true here, except now because current has a direction to it. Current has a flow to it. You see this minus sign shows up, and that's just because there's got to be a flow to the, the wave in its traveling direction. So I'm not going to derive this for you. I'm just going to, you guys can figure that out on yourself. But you can see the minus sign. 
There's two interesting things that show up, though, is that you got a velocity and you've got a Z0 that came out of this. All right? So these solutions are traveling waves, but they need two constants here. Okay? So the V plus is a wave traveling in a plus to X direction, V minus is a wave traveling in the minus X direction. And not all, everything has traveling waves, right? Some, is that largely by convention? Everything in the world is traveling waves. So you live in the world, so, so you, in, in the linear world, in the world of quantum mechanics, you can live in the world of position and time, or you can live in the momentum space, okay, which is the converse space, which is in terms of, uh, in terms of waves. So you, so everything is a traveling wave. You sitting there, according to quantum mechanics, is a bunch of traveling waves sitting together, staying there at the, at the same time, okay. So if you have a free electron running around there, that's just a forward wave. If you got electrons sitting in one spot, you have waves that are coming against each other, a forward and a reverse wave. So I didn't hate to be so philosophical. But in electrical engineering, everything is waves. Everything is waves. Even digital electronics, it's all waves. So that's the one thing that you're, you're learning from is that you used to do circuit theory, and you could do circuit theory that only works when the size of the circuit is much smaller than the wavelength. So typically the rule of thumb, if you're one-tenth, if your circuit size is one-tenth the wavelength, you can use that you don't have to worry about the waves. If you go above one-tenth, you got to start worrying about things. And you'll see this when we start doing these transmission lines that magically shorts become opens and opens become shorts as you go to high enough frequency. So those transmission lines that you see out running out here at 60 hertz, those have waves on them. Okay. In fact, um, if you think about it, if I picked up a phone and in the old days, let's see, not, not cell phones, I grab a phone, I pick you up, and I call Chicago okay, to wonder where our equipment is. All right? So I pick up the phone, call Chicago. People will sit there and say, well, the signal runs through the wires. Right? They sit there and say the signal runs through the wires. If you actually calculated the drift velocity of the electrons as it comes out of your phone, down through the wires, all the way to Chicago and back, let's assume that that was really the case. You'd, you'd sit there and take about an hour to talk to the person. Hello? Hello? Okay. So what it really is, it's an electromagnetic wave that rides around the conductors. Okay. So all of that is electromagnetic waves that ride around the conductors. Because if you think about it, is in a perfect conductor, how much energy is stored in it? Zero. Right? because there's no electric field in it. So there's zero electric field. So when people sit there and say there's energy inside a conductor, absolutely no energy in the conductor. It's in the electromagnetic wave that's sitting around the conductor, okay? And so transmission lines, uh, even the transmission lines that go from power plants, when they get an aurora borealis or something like this or a big solar flare, they notice it because the wavelength gets, becomes big enough, okay? So, I'm sorry to, to really hammer this the case, but what you're learning here waves is everything. Okay, it's just depending on the size of your circuit that counts. And the computer keeps falling asleep. Crap. I'll fix that. Sorry about that. Okay. So now, so what are these two constants? The velocity, okay, and you can see, going back to this, that this VEL, this is the velocity. Right? As t goes forwards, x travels at given by this ratio of x over t, and that's given by the velocity. And then this thing here, this is what's called the characteristic impedance. It's the ratio of the forward wave to the forward current wave. It's given by this. This has units of ohms. This has units of meters per second. Okay. So working this out, if you go back to those equations, you can find that the velocity is given by 1 over the square root of LC. And for a transverse electromagnetic wave, the phase velocity is only a property of the material of the wave that it travels through. And you can work it out. It's got to be given by 1 over the square root of mu epsilon. So no matter what you do, you put a coaxial line like you put a coaxial line that's huge, you put a twisted pair that's tiny together, it's only given by the material it flows through. It's not, it that has nothing to do with the geometry. That's not true for a waveguide, though, okay? The bigger the waveguide, then the, the velocity at a given frequency changes. The characteristic impedance is given as the ratio of L over C. It has units of ohms, and it's a function of the material and the geometry. So if you have a very tiny uh, center conductor on a coax, it has a high characteristic impedance compared to something with a very big uh, uh, conductor on it. 
Okay, so this is always remembered that this has to be independent of the material. All right, so let's let's just try to do this. So now we're going to go. We, we we're in the frequency domain. Now we're going to jump back out and let's do the time domain. We're going to have a voltage generator here, and we're going to have a uh, throw a switch, and we're going to send a transmission line that's going to go as a forward wave um, as a function of V plus, right? So you would imagine that, right? When you throw the switch, you would only expect a wave to go in this direction. You don't expect a wave to that's non-causal for a wave to show up coming back at you, right? There should be no reason why a wave comes back at you. Even though the transmission line can support it, it's not causal, so you get to throw one of them on. Okay. So now, okay, so what happens is this guy here, He's sitting there, and what is the ratio of this voltage to the current that's flowing on the forward line? It's given by Z0. So the characteristic impedance is not a resistor in a sense. It's just a ratio of the forward current wave and the forward voltage wave that go in there. All right. Now, what happens here is I hit this resistor, R sub L, here. This has a... So the... Uh, Ohm's law says the ratio of V over I has to be given by this resistance. So what must happen if this guy's relate ratio was given by V over Z0 and this hits this guy here? It must give rise to a reflected wave in order for me to solve that, be able to solve Ohm's law. Okay, so here you say that at this point here I have, if I just said it was just given by a forward wave, then I can't make this work because Z0 and RL might not actually be the same number. Z0 is just given by the geometry of the line. R sub L is given by what I put in there, what kind of resistor I put in there. When it hits this load at the end here, what must happen is I must generate a reflected wave in order for me to solve this boundary condition. Okay? So these two guys must be able to do it. And you can see now that the, the V plus plus V minus over V plus over Z0 minus V minus over Z0 have to be equal to R sub L. So you can think of the, re the reverse wave as thought of as, as the incident wave reflected from the load. So this is kind of a much different idea for me. You used to think of Ohm's law as just basically V over I is equal to the resistance. Now you're actually going to think about this as you have a forward wave coming down a transmission line. It hits something and reflects and comes back. Just like a mirror, you have you, you have light coming down, okay, hits the mirror, gets reflected back, and what's coming back off there is an incident wave and a reflected wave, and the mirror is just a resistor there. If it's a dull looking mirror, it has less uh, signal coming back. If it's a very shiny mirror, it has a lot of signal coming back. All right, so the ratio of V minus over V plus, working out the math, is R L minus Z zero over R L plus Z zero. And that's given by the reflection coefficient, and people usually give a, re, a capital uh, Greek letter, a G, gamma, that's reflection coefficient. So we have three really special cases. One is where R sub L is equal to infinity. That means it's an open circuit. So I have an open circuit. Then that means my reflection coefficient is plus one in this direction, and it's, it goes down here, and the reflected wave comes back in the same phase. Okay, it comes back with, this, with the same amplitude. Okay, and you can see the reason why that works is because with an open circuit, what's got to be the current in, at the low? It's got to be zero. So you'll see that the, going back to, oops, If this guy has the same amplitude, V minus has the same amplitude of V plus, the current's equal to zero. Right? Now, the next one is a short circuit. We put a short at the end of the line, then the reflection quotient has to be minus one. Because what is what is the voltage got to be across the, the resistor if it's a short circuit? It's got to be zero. But the current's got to be basically infinite. Right? And then there's the magic thing when RL is equal to Z0, then the reflection, co reflection coefficient is equal to zero. This is a very amazing uh, idea, is that a transmission line terminated with a resistor equal to the value of its characteristic impedance looks to the source as an infinitely long transmission line. So this is one of the things that we're going to do over and over in this class, is try to make it look like we've matched the load to the transmission line. That's what means matching the load to the transmission line. So if I made a box 
and I put a box and I put in an infinitely long transmission line in there, and I put a voltage pulse in there, okay, I don't expect anything to ever come back, right? It's infinitely long. It just goes forever, and it never comes back, right? Or I can take a short piece of transmission line and put a resistor equal to exactly to its characteristic impedance, and then basically I can't tell the difference, right? And this is a very good thing, as you can imagine, is if you're going to send a wave that you generate with your klystron down to an accelerating structure, you want it all to go into the beam. You don't want it to come back. So you would like to be able to match that. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about that. So this value Z0 is not a loss in the transmission line. It's a, relation, it's a ratio between the forward wave to the forward current, forward voltage wave to the forward current wave. It'll take a lot to get that through your heads. Okay, so now we did um, a semester already, and now the next thing is we're going to go into uh, sine waves. So most of the time in accelerators, uh, we, uh, we work with basically single sine waves. When Ralph and I used to work in stochastic cooling, we worked with broadband stuff. So people who work with damper systems, um, uh, feedback systems, all that kind of stuff, they work over broadband waves. Most of the time in accelerator land, you're working with a single frequency. So in a single frequency, we don't have to worry about pulses anymore. We could write our wave as a cosine, right? It's going to, be, it's going to have to show up as a cosine, because the solution to Maxwell's waves <coughs> equations at a single frequency is a cosine. So a forward wave is V plus cosine omega t minus beta x, and you could write it here, V plus e to the minus j beta x e to the, minus, e to the j omega t. This is the key part. Remember I talked about that e to the j omega t? If this is a forward wave, this has to be e to the minus j beta x. That means that this guy goes negative, and that's what your network analyzer is going to tell you about things. Okay? If you had e to the minus j omega t, this would go e to the plus. It's, it's uh, irrelevant as far as working in the, because we only work in cosine omega t by base x. But when you do displays, it's important to make sure you've got e to the j omega t. So the phase velocity is the ratio of omega over the wave number beta, and beta is just given by 2 pi over lambda. So I'm just writing these things out, assuming you guys remember this thing. So now, the nice thing about using a single frequency is we can define <laughs> uh, complex impedances. So before, we only talked about a resistor and opens and shorts, which are special cases. So again, let's take a look at what are some of the special cases. So when you take a look at this, a mirror is a short circuit, right? So if I sit there and look at the mirror in the morning, okay, basically light scatters off my body, heads to the mirror, and reflects back to me, okay, and that's what I see in my eye. And the reflection coefficient is minus one. And how can you tell that the reflection coefficient is minus one? You ever see your writing when you write across the mirror? Looks backwards. That's exactly the reflection coefficient equal to minus one. Okay, it seems really a hard way of solving things, but that's basically if, if the reflection co coefficient was plus one, we lived in some weird magical universe, the writing would look like you could read it. But the real reason is the writing looks backwards is because the reflection coefficient is minus one. So you see the backwards of that thing. kind of seems too obviously intuitive to even remark about it, but next time you'll never look in your mirror again without saying, oh, the reflection coefficient is minus one. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so anyway. So now, what happens when we have complex impedances like inductances and capacitances? Inductances are things that store magnetic fields. Capacitances are things that store um, electric fields. So here we have V is equal to L di dt. We can write as V equal J omega Li. The complex impedance is J omega L. For, um, again, for a, 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 um, again, for a, uh, a capacitor, I is equal C dv dt. I is equal to J omega C, Z is equal to 1 over J omega C. And you can see again, writing down what the time E to J omega T makes a difference. Okay, <clears throat> so what's going to happen is that we're going to send a wave down here, and we're going to have a complex impedance here, uh, uh, Z sub L here. And then if this is not matched, then we have to generate a reflected wave to match the boundary conditions. So at X equals 0, V minus is equal to gamma V plus which is equal to ZL minus Z0 over ZL plus Z0. So let's look along the transmission line. We have V is equal to V plus E to the minus J beta X plus gamma V plus E to the plus J beta X. So there's an E to the J mega T that I've thrown out here. I don't have it in here anymore. So here's my forward wave at E to the minus J beta X. 
Here's my reverse wave at e to the plus j beta x, and the reflection coefficient is gamma v plus. Okay? Now, what I can do is I can actually do some little bit of arithmetic here. I could separate this in terms of just having a forward wave. V is equal to V plus 1 minus gamma e to the minus j beta x plus 2 V plus gamma cosine beta x. So this is called the forward wave. This is the forward wave. And this is called the standing wave. All right? And so where do you actually see this kind of this thing work? Is that basically um, if you play the guitar, if you play the violin, all right? You basically have, you hold fixed points at the violin. You pull the violin string. A wave goes down, hits the fixed point. Since, the, since there's a, an impedance there, it's held, the, the violin string can't move, the wave must reflect. Wave comes back all the way over to the other end of the violin string. There's another fixed point, so it reflects back and forth. So basically, the wave is bouncing back and forth on the violin string, which is how it makes the sound, and that's a standing wave. You look at it, you click a, a violin string or a guitar string, and you can see it. You can see the envelope of the, of the wave there. You can see that it's zero at this point, and it's in there. That's a standing wave. When you first started it off, there was a wave going this direction. It bounces back and forth. So this is the standing wave that you would expect off a violin. And then you have the traveling wave. So one of the things that you could ask yourself is that you could see on this, if you take a look at those equations, you're going to have places where the voltage becomes a maximum and places where the voltage is a minimum, just like on a violin string. When you pluck it in there, it's a maximum in the middle, and it's zero at the ends, all right? And it doesn't ever change. The maximum is always there, and it's always zero at the ends. So now this is going to be the same case here, and working this out, what is the given where things are the maximum to where the minimum, which is called the voltage standing wave ratio. And Ralph and I will say the word viswar. So when you come out of this class, you can say the words vis viswar and db in any meeting, and you can shut up any project manager like this. Okay? So they say, well, that's the wrong viswar with the wrong db. I can't tell. Okay, so, um, so, so these is a very important word to remember to impress mom and dad. Okay, so now, again, this is your maximum voltage, and here is your minimum voltage. So this is where large current large voltage, small current, okay? The viswar is always greater than one. And so what does that really look like here in my fancy animation here? So you can see is I have right here, I have the green guy, that's my forward wave, and I have the magenta guy, that's my reverse wave. And they have different amplitudes, and they have different phases depending on the load. Okay, so you can see the green guy has a bigger amplitude, the, the pink wave has a smaller amplitude, but you can always see then the red guy, which is the resultant, always falls inside the envelope, okay? And so you can see that this guy here is that this would be like the violin string. This would be the envelope that you would see inside here, and this is the places where it doesn't move so much. But if you have part of a standing wave in here, this does not go down to zero, okay? So if you had no standing wave at all, you wouldn't expect to see any nulls. Okay, so for a perfectly, with no standing wave, the viswar is equal to 1. Okay, for a perfectly, totally standing wave, the viswar is equal to infinity. So a viswar is a way of telling you how matched you are to the system. So if you've got a viswar of 1, so if you go look at the specs, the mini circuit catalogs, they'll sit there and say, viswar equals 1. That basically means that it's a really matched thing. You'll never see anybody, if somebody puts down a viswar equals 1, they're lying. Okay, so normally you'll see a viswar of 1.1, 1.2, and that's pretty good. Okay, not so bad. Uh, if you see a viswar of 5, that's a pretty badly matched uh, system. Okay. So, now, again, typically though, what we, we talk about what happens at the load, what we're going to do is we're going to put a wave in here at the generator, and then we're going to send the wave down, it's going to hit our cavity, and it's going to come back at us. Okay. And typically, people always put the reference line at the cap, at the load, okay, at the coupler or something like that. That's the standard. They don't put it at the generator. Again, this goes back to your questions, what is phase? I can put this reference line anywhere I'd like. And you put the reference line in what makes life convenient for you. Most of the time, people put it right here at the load, okay? So what we're going to do is, though, we're going to send a wave in here. It's going to come back at us. 
Now, we're going to measure a reflection coefficient here, and we're going to measure a reflection coefficient here. We could. They're not going to be the same because this guy here has got a, the waves are the waves are going down and they're coming back, and they might show up in a different phase here than they were over here. And we'll work that out. So here is the here is the reflection coefficient at this point: ZL minus Z0 over ZL plus Z0. So the voltage then. Um, along anyway along the transmission line is V plus E to the minus J beta X plus gamma V plus E to the plus J beta X. I've written this a bunch of times. And gamma L at the load at X equals zero, gamma L is equal to this guy here. Right? Now, what happens at this generator? At the generator, we're at X equals minus 2 beta V. I'm uh, sorry. We're at X equals minus D. Here's X equals zero. Here's X equals minus D. So if I put in x equals minus d in here, I get the reflection coefficient of the generator is equal to gamma L e to the minus j 2 beta d. And there's a factor of 2 here, and that always has to do with the wave going down and back. Okay? So you always see this with the, with the transmission line. You'll sit there and see the length. It'll always look like for reflection, it's twice the length because the wave's got to go down and it's got to go back. We'll do this a lot in matching it. <laughs> you'll get this factor of 2 wrong always, okay? And then eventually you'll get the factor of 2 right, okay? So that tells you that the reflection coefficient at the load is not the same as the reflection coefficient at the generator. And this has some really major implications. Um, so, but there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between Zg and Z, Z sub L, okay? If you do know the reflection coefficient, at the, at the load, and you do know the length of line there, you can tell what the length, there, there's only one answer for what it is at the generator. It's, it's, it's known, all right? So you basically sit there and say, here's your reflection coefficient at gamma L, and then you just take this guy and you rotate it by 2 beta D, and that's your reflection coefficient at the generator. So you just take a piece of graph paper, you graph it, it's a complex number, we were, we're a single frequency now, right? So we get to do, you only get to do these complex numbers at one frequency. You can't do it at a bunch of different frequencies, and it goes back to your question again, is that you can't take a look at phase at one frequency and talk about it at respect to another frequency. Because the phases, they have nothing to do with each other. Phase at one frequency has nothing to do with phase at another frequency. Unless you're in special cases when you have a beam in which everything's locked, right? Where the beam keeps coming around at a time, then the frequencies can be locked together. Okay, so you can have multiples of frequencies locked together. But when I'm, that's a special case. But for the most point, you can't talk about phase at one frequency, at one megahertz, and talk about it has any meaning about phase at another frequency. Okay, so you only talk about phase at one frequency. Okay, so, the, so you can see then that the impedance now, if the reflection coefficient you can get from gamma L to gamma G just by taking a piece of graph paper. You also know that the reflection coefficient you wrote down before is Z minus Z0 over Z plus Z0. You can invert this equation and you can get that the, the impedance at the generator um, is equal to Z0 1 plus gamma G over 1 minus gamma G. That means that the transmission line changes the impedance of the load as seen by the generator. And that makes sense from a DC point of view because you put inductance and capacitance onto that load. So you'd expect the generator to see a different imp impedance than you do at the, at the load, right? So that just should just make sense to you. Okay, so now you can see that this, this impedance at the generator is given by this long formula that I won't even say, but it's, uh, it's straightforward. And you can see it's a function of the length of the transmission line. Dave, that's the impedance that you see looking into the terminals, that the generator sees looking at the terminals into the transmission. Right. So this one you know. Okay, this is the thing you, you built in your lab and you measured your impedance and you know what that is there. Now you stick a transmission line onto it and you want to sit there and say, what's the ratio of voltage to current at this point here? That's my impedance, the ratio of voltage to current at this point here. And it's related to this guy here, it's just solving circuits here. I know this impedance here. I know the inductance and capacitance of this transmission line. Therefore, I know the impedance at this point here. Okay. All right. So, for an open circuit, gamma L is equal to 
Uh, for an open circuit, z sub l is, is equal to inf infinity, so gamma l is equal to plus 1. Okay? And if I go back to that equation, the impedance of the generator is zg minus jz0 over tan beta d. Okay? So for beta d, very small, okay, I can expand this beta d for very small, tan beta d is equal to beta d. You can see that zg is equal to 1 over j omega c1 times the length of the transmission line which is expect you set ex exactly what you think. For an open circuit, a very short piece of open circuit, it looks like a capacitor, okay? And that's what you get. Now, once d gets to be equal to lambda over 4, okay, uh, tan beta d goes to infinity, okay? So the generator impedance looks equals to 0. This is a really big deal, okay? This is the one, one of the few things to take away from this class is that if you take an open circuit and you, put a, and you put a piece of transmission line that's equal to lambda over 4 long at a given frequency onto that thing, you will take that open circuit and make it look like a short circuit. You guys all know if you, if you, if you were stupid as a little kid like I was and you stuck a fork in an electrical socket, what happens, right? Okay, a spark happens. So the same is true here. If you have an amplifier, okay, and you think it's an open circuit, and the amplifier says, don't put a short circuit on this amplifier, and you put a lambda over 4 transmission line on there, it basically draws a ton of current on there until the, until the amplifier blows itself up, okay, in some cases. Right? So that's one thing that you have to be very, very aware of. The next thing you have to be very aware of is that one of the things that people love to do when they go out and troubleshoot equipment is they'll sit there and say, Oh, I, I have, I, I'm looking at the load here, I need to look at my, um, uh, on an oscilloscope. And I put a long length of transmission line onto this oscilloscope here. Okay, and I put this onto load. You actually can now make that open circuit, uh, actually I should go backwards. <coughs> Let me, before, I, before I tell you that story, let's do this one. For a short circuit, okay, um, well, I, I, let, me, let me finish that story. I'm sorry. It's been a while since I taught this. So, okay. so now you sit there and you say, okay, here's my... Um, here's my load here. And it's got this generator here. And something's broken here. I would like to know what's going on here. So what I'll do is I'll put a, a transmission line onto here. And I'll put this into my scope. And I won't do anything bad because I'll put that scope at one meg impedance, right? Because I, I, I'd like to not, not load down the circuit, so I'll put this at one meg impedance. So now, this guy, when this guy gets to be lambda over four, what does he look like here? He looks like a short circuit, okay? So you've really just destroyed your circuit by doing that. And you'll see a lot of people doing this where they'll leave, basically, they'll put T's, T's are one of the most dangerous things you can put into a circuit because somebody's going to leave a cable out there hanging out there and that can really destroy the impedance of that circuit, okay? So we'll, we'll get this when we talk about matching. But this is a very important point that you take through this thing is that opens are not opens and shorts are not shorts anymore. It depends on the frequency that you're at. Okay, now for a short circuit, Z sub L is equal to zero, gamma L is equal to minus one, impedance of the generator is JZ zero, tan beta D, and let's expand for beta D equal to one at low frequencies, this looks inductive. So if you take a transmission line and you short it, it looks like a piece of inductor. You're basically storing magnetic field in there. If, if D equals land over four, then basically this guy, uh, the impedance looks, infinite, uh, looks like infinity. So that means if I get a quarter wavelength away from short circuit, it now looks like an open. So again, this can have some dangerous features, but it also can have some really nice advantageous features. So for example, let's say you want to build a bias supply on your transistors. You're going to build an, an amplifier, and you need to put a bias supply onto these things. You can play these tricks by making opens look like shorts and shorts look like opens so that you can make your separate your bias circuit from your high frequency circuit. So people will do that, but you, we'll see that later on. All right. So, incident and reflected power. So the voltage of the generator, I'm going to make sure I don't you, you guys got to watch it, you? Um, the voltage and current at the generator at x equals d, okay, um, uh, uh, here at, the, at this generator here, that's, this is, this is the, this is what I'm supplying here, here's the load. 
So here's the voltage at the generator. I have to put in the reflecting coefficient. Here's the current at the, at the generator. And now what I'd like to do is what's the power, what's the rate of energy flowing through the plane at x equals minus d? So I take this guy times that guy, and I take, the, I take this times the complex conjugate of that, and I take the real part. That's the pointing vector. From the pointing vector times 1 half times the real part of e cross h. So the, the, the rate of energy flowing through here is equal to 1 half the real part of the voltage times the current complex conjugate. If you do that, mathematic, you will get the power that is equal to 1 half v plus v plus squared over z0 minus gamma l squared v plus squared over z0. And so now when people look at this, they'll sit there and say, aha, I have this looks like forward power. It's just got the v pluses here. This has, uh, this has um, gamma L V squared. This is the reflected power. So I have two types of power. I have forward power and I have reflected power. And the power that my generator delivers to the load is the difference between the forward power and the reflected power. Okay. So the only thing that's really bad about this, it's really a, a dangerous concept here, and, and, and maybe again I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, is that um, and I'll probably go to the next slide just to make sure I get the so, power does not flow. Energy does. Okay? So when you say forward power, you start saying that power flows. Power never flows. Power is the rate of energy flowing through a plane at any one given point. Okay? So that's power. It's it's you can only define power at a given point. You can't say I have power flowing through the line. You have energy flowing through the line. And energy is a con it has a magnitude and a phase, okay? Power doesn't, okay? And the way this works out, the reason why we can get forward and forward reflected power is because the, for a TEM line, the forward reflected power waves are power orthogonal. The cross terms canceled, okay, between the real and the imaginary part. They cancel because they're just power orthogonal. So that allows us to sit there and have this concept of forward power and reflected power in there, okay? Now, the difference is that what happens if somewhere along this transmission line, I put a divot in there, okay, I, I, I nip it or something like that. I'll get a reflection in there. And then I'm not going to, I'm going to have the modes mix, okay, I'm at the forward reflected power it mixes. So you've got to be careful that you don't think of power flowing, you think of voltages and currents are flowing, but not power is not flowing, okay. And the only way this works out is just because pure math, the power orthogonal. The same is true for waveguides. Uh, we talk about waveguides. Waveguides have different modes in them. Cavities have different modes in them as well. Right? So cavities can have different modes in them. If they're power orthogonal, mode from one in one waveguide, one, in one mode, doesn't mix with the that, that thing. So if you take a, a, um, a waveguide and it's overmoded, it has many modes going inside, <coughs> and you put um, crazy computer. Um, so uh, if, you, if you have this waveguide and you have forward and reverse waves going through it and they're not mixing, they're power orthogonal, or you have the same modes going through it but they're different, but there are different uh, modes in the waveguide, then they're power orthogonal. They never mix. If you put in one watt here, no watts ever goes into that mode. So one of the things that people thought about with the um, uh, ILC is eventually they wanted to have a very special mode called the, T, the, uh, the, the, the TE01 waveguide mode. It's a very special mode in which no energy gets lost by the, wall, by the walls. But it's a very high frequency mode. It takes a high frequency, the waveguide has to be very big in order to work. It's a wonderful mode, but it's not the fundamental mode. It's not the lowest mode in there. But if you, if you were able to make this magical waveguide mode, which does exist, and you start it off, you would get all your energy from your klystrons down to your tunnel without any loss at all. Huge for the ILC. That would be a great thing for it to happen. The minute somebody puts a dimple in that waveguide, then all the power, all the orthogonality goes out the window and the modes will mix. And then all of a sudden you'll get a whole bunch of mixing of that power into that mode, into other modes that you didn't expect to do. And that's one of the reasons why it's very difficult to make this TE01 waveguide to actually work in practice. Okay, so, um, but they actually did it, the VLA uh, in New Mexico. Those were all TE01 waveguide. And Ralph and I have a very funny story about, about going out there to look at that stuff. Um, but anyway, 
Uh, I just wanted you guys to really understand that power does not flow, energy does. So uh, obviously, again, here to take a look at this, to maximize the power transfer to the load, we want gamma L equals zero, which means ZL is equal to Z zero, just to really hammer this home. This is the forward wave. This is the reflected wave. The power generated by the klystron, which you spent all that money for, is the difference. You want to get rid of this term here. You want to make gamma L equal to zero. So in most cases, you're always going to want to match your load to the transmission line so you can get all your energy into that. Okay, so what if, so now basically you're not going to be able to just make this load anything you want. So you're going to make a cavity, and the cavity has constraints. It's got to fit in the tunnel. It's got to do all sorts of different things into this thing. So in, in general, this load here is not going to match Z0. So if they can't be made equal for, uh, we need to build some kind of network that basically can transform this impedance from here to there. And people, you've, you've done this at low frequencies. At low frequency, a transformer changes the impedance. So here, you know, we have 120 volts. And in, in, in Sweden, it's 230 volts. Um, and so there's, there's, when you bring over your equipment over there, you basically have to build some kind of transformer in order for it to work, okay? So otherwise you blow it up. You want to use only lossless devices such as capacitors, inductors, and transmission lines in our network. We don't want to dissipate any power in the network so that we, we want to put all the power in the load. So for example, if this was a, 50, if this was a 25 ohm resistor, this was a 50 ohm transmission line, the simple thing we could do is put 25 ohms in series. Right? But then we would dump half the power across our matching network, and that's not much use either. Okay. Sometimes you do that for broadbanding. Okay. So it would be easier if we normalize the impedance to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. Because the characteristic impedance of the transmission line is what we're going to try to match to. So we're going to now start talking about our impedances. We're going to divide it by Z0. So now this is what's called a normalized impedance. And you're going to see this on all the charts in the network analyzer. They're always normalized. Okay, and you could write them then the Z0, it's got a real part and it's got an imaginary part, R plus JX. All right, now the impedance then is, is the normalized impedance is going to be one, minus, one plus gamma over one minus gamma. And this, um, this now, they used to have a Z0 here, but we've designed, divided out the Z0. A little handy thing is how to remember this equation. I always get confused at remembering how to do this equation. But then I only just have to do is remember the three simple cases. For a matched load, the reflection coefficient is equal to zero. For a short circuit, the reflection coefficient is equal to minus one. For an open circuit, it's equal to plus one. So here, if I want to know if this is right, you put in gamma equal to minus one here. Okay. Um, sorry, if you, sorry, if you want to put in an open circuit, gamma is equal to plus one. One minus plus one. That's equal to zero, the impedance is equal to infinity. If this was equal to a minus one here, this cancels, that gives us a short circuit. Okay? So that's how I remember this equation, because I usually can't remember if it's plus on top or a minus on top. And the same is true with the ZL and the, Z, the, 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 the other way around the equation. Okay. Now, the reflection, the, the reflection coefficient is also a complex number. It's U plus JV. This is the standard way of doing this. So if I take this equation here, and I stick it into this equation, put this equation into here. You could spend yourself doing a whole night of algebra, um, and you can come up with these two equations. R is equal to this equation here. X is equal to this equation. So here I've separated R in terms of just the reflection coefficient, and X in just in terms of the reflection coefficient. Lunch is at, at noon. Yeah, OK. All right. Now, I can then take these little two little formulas, and I can rewrite them. And you can see here, these guys now look like equations for circles, okay? This has got coefficient of one, coefficient of one, here's its radius. Here's its radius here, and these are just offsets. So this has an offset here, this is offsets. So basically, these guys trace out, um, these guys trace out circles. So what does this mean? And my computer gets a little messy at this point, okay. So let's just basically sit there and say, I'm plotting impedance. And that's what you're always, you're, 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 I'm sorry, I'm plotting reflection coefficient. Most of the time, we're only going to be plotting the reflection coefficient, okay? Because that's the only thing we can really measure in the laboratory. 
So we were, in, with the network analyzers, they only measure reflection and transmission coefficient. They don't measure anything else. They don't measure impedance. But what we did when we designed our circuit, we talked about impedance. We didn't talk about reflection coefficient. So a lot of times we want to know, given a given reflection coefficient, what's the impedance? Given the impedance, what's the reflection coefficient? Okay, so we're going to want to know this question a lot. So here I'm plotting the reflection coefficient. It's got a real part. It's got an imaginary part. It's some vector. Now, what turns out, the lines of constant no impedance trace out circles like this, where the circles keep, keep always one side over to the edge, but they always keep move this edge over here. This is the real part equals zero is the red circle. So that means that the real part is the resistor, the resistor part is always equal to zero here. Here's the real part equal to one is the green circle here. Okay. The different circles what's changing the impedance of the transmission line or the impedance of the load? It's um, nothing's changing. It's the places that say that let me let me try to state this in a, in a, this is this is a hard jump to make, so this is confusing. If <clears throat> I had a load, um, a box a load, and I could keep, I could twiddle the, res the, the real part and twiddle the imaginary part independently, okay? Um, and let's sit there and say, I have this box, and I basically, I'm only going to twiddle the imaginary part, okay? And I ask myself, what's the reflection coefficient every time I make that? If I keep the real, if I put that real part equal to zero, and I twiddle that imaginary part, it's just going to run around. The reflection coefficient must lie somewhere on this red circle. Okay. If I um, if I equal have the real part equal to 50 ohms, and I twiddle the imaginary part, the reflection coefficient must run around on this circle here. Okay. This is the point where the imaginary part is equal to zero. The real part is equal to 50 ohms. Okay. So think of it. When you think of this, I have a box with a real imaginary knob. Mm -hmm. I can twist these guys. I'm going to hold my real part constant, and I'm going to take my imaginary part, and I'm going to twist it. Okay. And the different circles are different. Every time you turn the real knob, you get, you get a different circle. circle. So these are maps of the real part of the impedance on the reflection plane. Okay. <clears throat> so we're on the reflection plane, and we're going to put a map of the real part of the impedance on the reflection plane. Okay. Now my computer is messed up and it doesn't show the imaginary parts, but I will show you on the Smith chart. So uh, I'll, I'll fix this. My computer lost its font. So, um, here are the imaginary circles. So the imaginary equal to, to zero is a straight line at infinite. Okay, like this. The imaginary part equal to one is this guy. Minus one is that guy. These are the real circles. These are the imaginary circles. So this is the Smith chart. Okay, Smith chart was invented in the 1930s for a graphical way of, for people to solve uh, solve uh, um, uh, RF circuits. Um, nobody solves things by graphs anymore, right? Because computers just do this thing. But the Smith chart is a great way of trying to look at something and understand how it's going to behave. Okay, so it's important. This is one of these things where it's just important to learn the basics. So when you look at this thing, you're going to look at something at the lab, and you can put that on a Smith chart and say, if I change that, it's going to go this way, and that'll be bad, or that'll be good. So it's really important to get a good feel for the Smith chart. It's so important that they still keep Smith charts on these multi-million, multi-hundred thousand dollar network, ten thousand dollar network analyzers. They're so important that they haven't taken them off. And they wouldn't take them off they take them off in a heartbeat if people didn't want them, but they're very important for people to use them. So even though this is 1930 technology, this is really important to know. The other thing is it's a conformal map, so people who have done complex variable theory. So in the, if you were in the impedance plane, okay, the impedance plane, you'd have, real, you'd have real values going along like this, and you have imaginary values like this. You do a conformal map between the real part to the reflection part, because it makes these circles here. So it's just a conformal map. So if you're a high energy physicist and you understand conformal maps, this is just a conformal map. But what you're always going to remember, in a Smith chart, you're always living in the reflection plane. This is a plot on the reflection plane, so I will have a reflection coefficient here, and once I do that, I can always read off my impedance by looking at the Smith chart. So we'll do an example. It'll be, it'll be even foggier in a second. Okay. 
So let's just say I have a reflection coefficient of 0.5 angle 45 degrees. Just somebody gave me this device and it measured 0.5 angle 45 degrees. And I don't even draw my real and imaginary axis. So here's my real axis, here's my imaginary axis. I draw something that's 0.5 long, it's halfway between here and here, and it's at 45 degrees. So this is my reflection coefficient. Here's the real part of the reflection coefficient, here's the imaginary part of the reflection coefficient. That makes sense, everybody? Right. Okay. Now, what is z sub l? Well, z sub l, what I can do is I can read off this curve here, and it's on the 1.35 real circle right here, and it's on the imaginary 1.35 circle here. So it's 1.35 plus j1.35. I normalized here, because this is a normalized Smith chart. I multiply it by 50 ohms if I'm using a 50 ohm system. If, I, if I'm using a 75 ohm system, I multiply by 75 ohms. And my impedance is 60, 67.5 ohms plus j67.5 ohms, okay? So you say, yeah, I could have done that with a programmable calculator faster than you could have done this, okay? So, but basically it's a quick way of me being able to write down what the reflection coefficient is and read the impedance like that. Guaranteed the first time we do the matching lab, this is going to go upside down with you guys in, in really short order. Okay, then, now let's try this one. Given ZL is 15 ohms minus J 25 ohms, Z0 is equal to 50 ohms, what is gamma L? Well, the first thing you do is you normalize it. Z sub L is equal to 0.3 minus J 0.5, and you plot it. Here is the real equals 0.3 circle. Right here. Here is the j equals minus 0.5 circle right here. And so the reflection coefficient is here, and its magnitude is 0 0.618. Its angle is minus 124 degrees. Okay? So we're going backwards and forwards. So this is just so simple. It's like doing, you know, a conversion between miles per gallon and, and kilometers per, you know, whatever, gallon or something like this. It's, it's just a graphical way of doing things. Okay. So now it gets, it gets a little bit more fun. So now let's sit there and say we have a load, 50 ohms plus J, 50 ohms, and we put a transmission line on the end of this thing, okay? What's going to be the impedance coming in here? What is this impedance going to look like? So, and we're gonna do this at 50 megahertz. And I chose a very magical number so that the, the, the answer comes out nice, okay? So I start off, Z in, what's Z in at 50 ohms? So, the, or the, what is Z in at 50 ohms? What's, ZL, what's the ZL normalized? It's 1 plus J1. Okay, that's the normalized there. And so that, I would go with the real equals 1 circle, the imaginary equals 1 circle, plot it there, and boom, that's my reflection coefficient. My reflection coefficient is 0 .45, 0 0.445 angle 64 degrees. Now, I'm going to, that's, that's my reflection coefficient looking right here. Where's, where's the 0.445? The 0.445 is the length of this guy here, is the length of this guy. But remember in a Smith chart, the length from here to here is 1. So for a passive load, the reflection coefficient can never be a greater than 1. You can't get something bigger coming at you than you sent out. All right? So this, is, this, is, this, this length here from here to here is 1. So what I do is I plot real equals, here is the real equals 1 circle. Here's the imaginary equals one signal, where they two intersect. I put a dot there, and my, my reflection coefficient is the vector that goes from here to here. So what's the length of this? What is the length with respect to what? It's the length with respect to one. Okay, so this is 0.445 of this length here. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And this angle here, this is the angle from off the real axis, which is 64 degrees. Okay? All right, now. What we do then is that now, remember, we, we realize when you move away from the load, you rotate the reflection coefficient by, by the angle, by the down and back. And the down and back is going to be equal to 2 beta d, which turns out to be equal to 2 omega tau. Okay? Um, this is something that I didn't really write out, and you can convince yourself. You normally will use this. When you, get, when you go to the lab, and you see that today, we're going to give you eight nanosecond cables or one nanosecond cables. So what does that mean? That means that if I send a pulse in there, it takes one nanosecond for that pulse to come out. All right, that's what I mean by one nanosecond. Even though it's about a foot long, okay, it takes one nanosecond to go out. So you normally see cables in the lab labeled by time instead of being labeled by length because you have to know what the, the velocity is and stuff like that. So people usually put in like one nanosecond cables or eight nanosecond cables. So. 2 beta d is 2 omega tau. 2 omega tau 
is 244 degrees, okay, because I know what my frequency is, and I know what this thing is, it's 6.78 nanoseconds, it's 244 degrees, that means my reflection coefficient rotates by 244 degrees, and I magically pick this number here, that you see that, boom, this guy landed on the real, the imaginary equals zero circle, which is infinitely in radius, and the real equals 0.38 circle. So my impedance is 0.38 plus J0 ohms, which is basically 19 ohms. So this impedance went from 50 plus J50 ohms to 19 ohms with this transmission line in there. Okay? So this kind of tells you right away, very quickly, what you can do. You plot your, you, you plot your load here, you plot your rotation here, and you can sit there and say, well, it's over here, my impedance got lower. It's over here, my impedance got higher. So you can kind of walk your way around the SNF chart if you need to know higher and lower impedances. Okay, so um, this will really ruin your lunch, but we'll just, I think we can get through this uh, real quickly uh, for lunch. Um, a matching network, maybe we should just break for lunch before we do this, because this will just ruin your lunch. Let's just, let's just do, let's, let's, uh, let's do this, we come back, and we'll do the, some matching examples, and that'll take a little bit to do that. Okay? Take all your stuff that you go to rearrange tables to set up the equipment.